Good day. I'm Sister Callista Roy from the Cannell School of Nursing at Boston College. Together with the Roy Adaptation Association executive board members and fellows, I'm the author of the book, Generating Middle Range Theory, Evidence to Practice. It's my pleasure to bring to you a series of videos with slides that introduce each part of the book. So today I am presenting part one, introduction. This will include chapters one and two. Chapter one is on the overview of processes for creating knowledge for practice. And chapter two is on the processes that we used for describing and critically analyzing our research. Chapter one then, overview of the processes for creating knowledge for practice. First, we recognize that nursing develops knowledge to meet changing needs of society. A major issue for us is to close the gap between knowledge developed by both theory and research and implementation in practice. I will summarize just a few of the key facts in the chapter about the great growth period in nursing knowledge development that began in the 20th century. We see the parallel between what was going on in nursing education and nursing theory. In 1949 through about uh, 1955, baccalaureate programs were developing. Now currently, we have about 700 baccalaureate programs. In 1964 to 1975 was the growth and maturing of the master's education in nursing, particularly advanced practice of both clinical nurse specialists and nurse practitioners. Currently, we have 300 master's programs. In the uh, 19 70s and uh, the 1980s was the developing of the research doctorate in nursing and currently there are 126 PhD programs. Also uh, in the 1990s we began to have postdoctoral studies in nursing being both encouraged as well as funded. Simultaneously uh, with this timeline, in nursing theory, we had great developments. One quote is from Dorothy Johnson's 1959 classical paper. Current, certainly no profession can long exist without making explicit the theoretical base for practice so that the knowledge can be communicated and expanded. A little later, um, there was the need for knowledge from a nursing perspective that led to significant influence of theorists as a professional uh, discipline. This was increased based on the fact uh, that the schools were developing so rapidly. And we began then also to have uh, journal, journals and books uh, and theory conferences. The philosophical perspectives of the person also were developing. Caring as a core concept, Leininger's work, Watson and Benner, the free agent and choice Forum. Roy, shared purposefulness of humankind, and Newman, the patient as the whole and expanding consciousness, some of the key ideas of developing nursing theory. And these theories then were used for education, practice, and research. All theory 
advanced scholars uh, saw the need uh, to put increase the cadre of nurse researchers uh, that would confirm the theories and lead to knowledge for practice. So we have this parallel growth in education and theory. The commonalities of nursing for the 21st century, I think, coalesced around focusing on the holism of the person. Nursing involves Secondly, the transforming relationships of the nurse with the patient. Early in the 21st century, we have extensive changes in advanced practice based on expanding knowledge of persons, increased complexity of patient care, national concerns about the quality of care and patient safety, and shortages of nursing personnel and demands for higher level of preparation for leaders who can design and assess care. In 2004, we have the American Association of Colleges of Nursing taking a position statement call, that called for advanced practice registered nurses and the Doctor of Nursing Practice, DMP programs. 2010, the Affordable Care Act passed, and placing emphasis on primary care and the role of the nurse. By 2011, the American Association of Colleges of Nurses reported 182 Doctor of Nursing Practice programs, and practice over the next decade will show, they say, whether the DNP movement will actualize the much anticipated bridging of the gap between nursing knowledge and nursing practice. This is an effort to bridge that gap, but we will see if it in fact does. Let's look now at the development of research for knowledge for practice. Theory and research go together to create knowledge for practice. We are accustomed to the image of the double helix. And research resources grew along at, with the topics studied. So the timeline for re nursing research development, we can look at both the topics and then the resources and organizations funding them parallel in a timeline. The 1940s and 50s, research was mainly on nursing workforce. The 1950s and 60s, on nursing education studies. But increasingly, into the 1990s, clinical research became a focus as organizing, uh, organizations set priorities, held conferences, and later funded research. Now, what was going on with the resources? Early on, the American Nurses Association Commission on Nursing Research was hugely important, as was the organization Sigma Theta Tau International. Regional research organizations were developed. In 1956, we have the first federal funding. The U.S. Public Health Service research grants were available. The Division of Nursing provided support for doctoral fellows. 1985, the National Center for Nursing Research was established, and then by 1993, it became an institute of nursing research. So the challenge of nursing knowledge reaching practice, I think currently we could highlight two major approaches. One, the National Institute of Nursing Research emphasis on translational research to apply knowledge derived from the basic healthcare research to interventions that improve health. The uh, perspectives of nurse scientists are vital uh, to identifying the most effective strategies to accelerate translational research. One example uh, provided 
this approach from bedside to bench to practice a description of the series of NIH, NINR funded clinical and laboratory studies on improved outcomes for patients who receive tube feedings. This is uh, Matheny's work and um, it was summarized in 2011. Other, another approach to nursing knowledge development and having knowledge reach practice is what we've called evidence-based practice movement, EPB. In the 1990s, the term research utilizations was superseded by the movement for evidence-based practice to address concerns without about limited use of research in providing nursing care. So evidence-based practice then is a problem-solving approach to the delivery of health care that incorporates the best evidence with well-designed studies and patient care data and combines it with the patient's preferences and values of the nurse and the nurse's experience. Vanat, uh, Overthalt, and uh, Stillman uh, and other authors have talked about this and settled on this description. The aims are that there is higher quality of care, improved patient outcomes, a reduced cost, and greater nurse satisfaction, and a framework for lifelong learning for nurses. Now we can critique these knowledge to practice approaches. Translational research provides a depth of knowledge that takes an extraordinary amount of time and resources and handles only one clinical issue at a time of potentially hundreds of issues. Advantages of the evidence-based practice may be exaggerated. Clinical judgment and patient input may receive less attention, and this gives priority to empiric approaches to knowledge without a way of integrating other ways of knowing. So we propose then a unique approach to relating theory to practice by way of research. Uniting the strengths of theory and research as a basis for practice, accumulating large numbers of studies based on similar concepts, the concepts of a grand theory, and using multiple methods. We can capitalize on the benefits of middle range theories as closer to practice, relevant across settings, and when supported, providing evidence. So we have then our book. Now our rationale for middle range theories. I gave a few advantages. The middle range theories can have a transformational effect on the entire discipline of nursing. Middle range theories are particularly useful in today's focus on interdisciplinary teams to meet healthcare needs. And middle range theories can be derived from theory, research, or practice. So the process for using Roy adaptation model research to develop middle range theories and evidence. Let me go through how we did that. We have a large database of studies based on the Roy adaptation model. It was collected and critically analyzed. It was organized into major topics for middle range theory development we outlined a six-step process for generating middle range theory, providing evidence for practice, and recommending changes in practice. This six-step process of generating middle range theory begins, one, studies are selected that cluster together by similarities, two, the studies are used as observations classified and major concepts identified. 
Three, the concepts are discrete and observable, but at a level of abstraction that can be generalized across clinical situations. Four, the concepts are used to draw a pictorial schema of the interrelated concepts. Five, the inter identified concepts are interrelated in theoretical statements and propositions. And lastly, number six, the findings from the research are used to, to provide evidence to support the new middle range theory and to recommend changes for practice. Now chapter two of the book, as I noted, moves to processes for description and critical analysis of the research that we want to use. So first, there's a literature research, the strategies uh, for screening and describing the studies, and processes for evaluating the studies. And then I will also discuss the results of the selection and evaluation processes and the organization of the studies for presentation. So the literature review, 350 citations were identified with search words, Roy adaptation model, and research. Hand searches of abstracts by undergraduate research fellows working with the theorist provided for deleting 150 studies, either not research, not truly using the Roy adaptation model, or being a duplicate citation. We then had 200 complete publications. We retrieved the entire publication. These then were reviewed by the Roy Adaptation team. One, there was a form for description. This included authors, year, purpose, subjects, design, including measurement, and findings. Two, there was a form for rating the quality of the research on a list of criteria. They could be scored from one to five, five being the best. So the results of the review, 172 studies met the criteria for both research and the links to the model criteria. 103 were in refereed journal publications, and 69 were dissertations. Articles pu were published in 47 English-speaking journals. Dissertations completed at 32 different universities in the United States, and one in Finland that was in English. So now I'm just going to summarize how we, uh, the studies and how they were organized, primarily by method. Qualitative studies, n equaled 40. Using content analysis, seven studies. Grounded theory, four. Ethnography, three. And the highest number, 17, used phenomenology. Mixed methods, six studies, and case analysis, three studies. In the quantitative studies, we had a total of 126. Descriptive quantitative, 59. Studies that explained, predict, and prescribe, 43. Interventions, 25. And lastly, there were five published studies that were instrument development. Now in closing, I want to point out that through this process, we now have major clusters of studies for generating middle range theories. And these theories will be general coping, adaptation to life events, adaptation to loss, adapting to chronic health conditions, and adaptation in family health.